Good afternoon. My name is Eric Williams. On this Saturday, December 6, 1986, I'm meeting here uh, on behalf of the Palm Springs Public Library Local History Project. We are at the home of my father, Stuart Williams, who has been a long time practicing architect here in the Palm Springs desert area. Joining us is my uncle, Roger Williams, who practiced architecture with my father for many years and who is now retired and living in the San Diego area. My father and my uncle, over 40 years ago, came to the desert to join their father, Harry Williams, in architectural practice. And my uncle and my grandfather were originally hired by Mrs. Carnell to design and build the Plaza Shopping Center, which now is the, at the very heart of downtown Palm Springs. Roger, perhaps you could tell us a little more about the circumstances under which you and Harry were hired by Mrs. Carnell and moved here from Dayton to do that project. Well, if I can remember back the 50 years correctly, uh, I might start saying Mr. Carnell, who spent her winters here at the Desert Inn with a friend of Nellie Kaufman, uh, was the wife of the Comptroller, I believe it was, of National Cash Register and Dayton and we since my father's big firm there had done all their buildings and many industrial buildings around Dayton why she asked her financial advisor my father to come out I think it was in 34 to look around Southern California to find where's a good place to invest money she felt this is a growing area so they came out and they finally after looking at Mexico and all around settled on uh, Palm Springs and they built what is now known as the Carnell Building. Just a small building with apartments above and shops below. Well, it rented so fast and successfully that uh, Mrs. Carnell said, well, I think I'd like to try and build the plaza that you now know as the plaza. And it was one of the very first early shopping centers in California. So uh, this was now, I think Carnell Building was built in 34, and I came to Palm Springs in 36 because this was the plaza. They started to clear the property. We had most of the drawings done. But my purpose in coming, my father, I was fresh out, I must say, I was fresh out of college with a degree and all, but I didn't really know too much. So I'm sure I would go from being the blueprint boy for my father uh, when he was here, and then when he go back east to, for his big office, well, I became the head man and paid all the payrolls. So, it was back and forth, but uh, I have to say my first impressions of Palm Springs, uh, as I came in across in January 6th of 36, snow and ice could hardly get here, and then when I hit here, it was a lovely evening, and I found out later it was unusual weather for January, it was around 85, 90. And here was this lovely village with hibiscus and trees and greenery and there were no sidewalks there were little movie startups tripping up and down the sand and i thought man is this heaven see i thought this is it so uh, now so i was very happy to come well I, we we took mrs i think it was dr white's cottage that was on the site i think that's the one we disconnected from the chimney and put it up on a set of wheels and as we built progressive different buildings of the whole plaza they'd move us around and this uh, I'd like to add a funny little item to this because th that house and where the chimney had been was also half the bathroom so when they pulled the house loose that left half the bathroom open to the public <laughs> but it really didn't bother us that summer because it faced Palm Canyon but uh, a car would come down the highway maybe once every two hours three hours you never knew but if, they, if you were taking a bath, you just tip your head and they'd honk the horn. And <laughs> very, very pleasant atmosphere, see? Was the, was, the, was the plaza actually at the center of the town? Oh, it was. On one side was uh, Indian Avenue. It was a dirt road with beautiful trees hanging over it. And Palm Canyon was a little two-lane pavement uh, blacktop road. Of course, Bull and Bullocks, none of these stores were there. And so this was just a big property with lots of beautiful palms that we all try to save, we dug them up, moved them aside, put them back in. But we built, actually, we started like, I think it was the, what was the post office then, and uh, and that had restaurants above, and then we just kept going right around the theater, ended up eventually with what was the garage building and storage building, with chauffeur's quarters above that. It was a new 
idea for Palm Springs. And it was the first area that had internal parking off the streets. That was that first two little streets that went connected Palm Canyon with Indian Avenue with on-site parking. And that was a, rent a, a new idea in California. And to get this inspiration for Spanish, of course, coming from Dayton, I, we had it in mostly Italian and modern various things there, but Mr. Carnell hired a plane for us and we flew up to Santa Barbara. And the old, I guess they called it the plaza or something up there, it was a lovely, it's still there, lovely old quaint Spanish design with the little wrought iron grills, mm -hmm. which was all new to us, you see, and we wandered around through there and absorbed the atmosphere. And then came back and tried to do likewise down for the plaza. Our engineers in the meantime didn't knew nothing about earthquakes, so they came out and went to Long Beach where they just had the big 33 quake and studied up all the latest information on what kept a building up during an earthquake. So they tried to incorporate those ideas, but as I look back now, as we found more and more about earthquakes, I was really kind of worried about the plaza because although it had more steel than any other building in Palm Springs compared to what we do now, it wasn't that heavily reinforced. And now, as it's gone over the 40 years since, 50 years, I look and I see they've taken out another arch and put in a pipe column so they can have more plate glass windows. That bothers me too because the pipe column does not give any uh, resistance to earthquakes. So. But that was that early stage and uh, and I'm so glad I was here. We, the first summer, uh, the town emptied out by April. There wasn't a thing going. They kept the movie open for the workmen and a bowling alley and Patterson's Drug Store where we ate all our meals. And I got the nickname a rattlesnake beat because I killed one rattler a day on Palm Canyon between where the plaza is and where the drugstore was up there by the, beyond the desert end. <laughs> so you could see his big change and the horse stalls and all were right on Indian Avenue. Get on my horse and ride forever towards Indio. There wasn't a thing in that direction. So, As a child, I always remember uh, going up to the rooftop of the plaza to what was Probably one of your original offices, is that where you That's my dad, uh, as it was, I, as I said, I went back to Dayton in 36 to marry my wife. Uh, my dad finished the plaza buildings, and then about this time my mother was becoming more of an invalid with arthritis, so dad felt the climate out here agreed with her, so he theoretically retired from the big office and uh, stayed here from 40 on. And then uh, both Stu and I, I think, during the war, Stu was in the Navy and I was designing airplanes. We came down, I think it's 42 and 43, to visit them. But this time, Palm Springs had already grown with the airport. and It was entirely different, paved streets, walks. But uh, Dad had retired, as I say, but then everybody uh, would come and ask questions about, have you done a hospital? Yes, he'd done many hospitals all over the United States. Uh, so he started making sketches and things. First thing you knew, he was, back in Arctic, all by himself, up in the, one of these little roof shelters. Mm -hmm. And about that time, when the war ended, I wrote him, I said, well, I don't know whether to go back in your big firm, or are you really busy enough to stay in one more dress? And he said, I'd sure like to have it. And I said, well, can you guarantee any work? And he wrote back, can't guarantee a thing, but you come take your own chances. So I came out in 45, and then Stu came down, I guess it was in thir uh, 46, the very next spring. And we were here ever since until 77 when I retired. And he doesn't know enough to retire. He's two years <laughs> old and I am still working. But, but that's about the story of the early days. Did Mary do any other particular uh, jobs or projects between that period of 36 to 45 that you view as uh, important pieces of work in this area? Well, actually not in Palm Springs. He went back, you know, after the after the plaza was built. He actually went back to Dayton, and uh, they went on with the work there uh, as much as there was. Of course, it was in the bottom of the depression, and uh, that, of course, is uh, part of the reason I think that. Uh, that uh, he decided, I think, to come out here because the Depression was a, a very catastrophic uh, event in the life of most architects. The large firms mm -hmm. in New York City were 
completely uh, devastated. There, I was looking for jobs in those days, having gotten out of school in '33, and um, you'd find a big firm that might have had four or five hundred people in their firm. At that time, there would just be the two partners and maybe one secretary, mm -hmm. and that was the staff. So uh, it was a time for change, and I think that uh, that was, as much as anything, a break in the continuity of this large office that Harry had back in Ohio with Harry Skank, and it gave him an opportunity to come out here with my mother, and then the war came on, mm -hmm. and those two things followed immediately one after the other, and that was the big break between Ohio and California. and. Uh, I think it was that and my mother's health uh, was the reason that we came, of course, to California, essentially. There was one little uh, point that I think uh, would uh, help to give some uh, idea of the um, size of Palm Springs when uh, Harry and Roger were working on the project, and I've been told this by my father, that uh, Mrs. Kaufman, who was the uh, owner, of course, of the Desert Inn and a great friend of Mrs. Carnell, I think uh, Mrs. Carnell had stayed every year at the, at the uh, Desert Inn, and they'd become great friends, and uh, Mrs. Kaufman would leave the Desert Inn, which was um, just about a block away from the plaza, and uh, come down on her morning walk and uh, she'd look over the progress and everything and uh, invariably say I just don't understand Julia Carnell putting so much money so far out of town <laughs> and that was an indicative of the size mm -hmm. of Palm Springs uh, I brought over some uh, photographs that uh, we uh, apparently were taken, and I'm not sure who the photographer was, but during those uh, uh, first years, there was uh, some attempt at, uh, as there has been many other times in Palm Springs, to uh, um, sort of uh, upgrade the town. And somebody took these photographs just up and down what was then the entire town. and. I can't believe what I'm looking at. I just got them out of some old files this morning, and I thought it might be interesting. I have some of the Desert Inn, some of the Oasis Hotel, uh, and of the Dr. White property right across from the Desert Inn. And in a sense, that's the way Palm Springs looked uh, just after the plaza was built. Uh, in the uh, between the early 40s, let's say it's the early 40s. It was taken. I think these were taken perhaps before I came to Palm Springs, but it's uh, along in the early 40s, and you can see the automobiles look well, like we it. Take a look at them. Well, this uh, uh, these uh, these photographs were taken, I think, in the early 40s, and uh, represent the Palm Springs that uh, we found when we at least Mari and I and. Rod and his wife when we came back after the war. Um, <clears throat> the Desert Inn, of course, was the, you know, the very center of Palm Springs and the, really the only major hotel. Um, hang on your tape. Okay. It rings. We yeah. shut it off and well, take it. Yeah. You're not yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, this is a, a shot of the entrance to Desert Inn, which of course was the center of all activity in the in the town. At that time, the largest hotel here, and uh, along with the Oasis Hotel, and uh, of course there, uh, it was still very much of a of a country hotel. These lovely uh, open gates and open space, and a lot of palms. Practically only a, a number of palms are in Palm Springs. Were in either the Desert Inn or across the street in the old Wellwood Murray Library. Uh, if you just hang on to that, mm -hmm. Rod. Um, as you came off the side here, you uh, you came up to the end of this wall, and here is a another shot, sort of continuing on up. This yes. is where Magnan's uh, store was at that time, and um, that was it. That was it. Just this one little little shop here, 
And then just to the north of that uh, was another little uh, uh, bit of a shop. Uh, I don't know, uh, jewelry and something of that sort. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, adjacent to that, just hang on to that, don't mm -hmm. keep it up there a minute. Yeah, right. Adjacent to that, here was the old coffee shop. It was all mm -hmm. on the street where most of us uh, could find uh, some coffee in the summertime and even it closed down for at least two months. And then um, just on the tail end of that picture, you can hang on to that, uh, uh, this was the Desert Inn garage. That you can see mm -hmm. the roof over here in this corner. And uh, all of this is where uh, uh, the new hotel is, the Maxime's Hotel. Mm -hmm. This is sitting there. Goes from and Bank uh, of America, and huh? this is the mm -hmm. corner of, of the mm -hmm. Maxime Hotel. And this is a, uh, Andreas Road leading back to the O'Donnell Golf Course. And um, then right up at this uh, point, going on beyond that, uh, you had... Uh, you had the uh, uh, the only place that I think that did stay open the full summer was this little village pharmacy oh, yeah. r right here on the corner. You can see the corner of it here. Mm -hmm. uh, that came next and then uh, uh, our favorite uh, hangout uh, was of course Gigi, <laughs> which was right here. <laughs> Before and that, was, a, large, that yes. was the bar and the place where mm -hmm. the whole town congregated, all 10 or 12 of us during the summer. And that was the other end of the Chi Chi. Yeah. That's, that's the facade <laughs> along Palm Canyon that you, uh, the elegance of the, of the place. However, there was a place right across the way that I felt uh, uh, was quite nice. Um, the uh, Wellwood Murray Library. Uh, occupied um, uh, the space oh, yeah. right across from the Desert Inn. Uh, actually, this was across from the o uh, Desert Inn was over here. This was across from the Oasis Hotel. But um, going north now uh, it was this property. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this was uh, part of the area that was um, that was Dr. White. Uh, Dr. White's. Mm -hmm. Let's go up this mm -hmm. way. <laughs> Uh, it was all just heavily wooded area like this, mm -hmm. and uh, that was Paul Grimm's oh, yes, right Ray. here, his mm -hmm. little studio. This is what you walked along on Palm Canyon across from the Desert Inn. Um, it is the site of the old uh, Wellwood Murray Hotel, and there were little cottages back, and I think the old hotel had, had been uh, uh, actually um, dismantled by that time. And uh, but it was a, a totally open area, and this whole square belonged to Dr. White, her sister, um, Cornelia. Cornelia White. Uh, Miss Cornelia, of course, gave the site for the mm -hmm. old desert museum that was down on top with McCallum. Uh, and uh, Dr. White offered this whole property in the heart of Palm Springs, a whole block, to the city which is then incorporated in 38 and offered it to them if they would just pay the taxes on they said they couldn't afford it <laughs> to keep it as a park in the center of Palm Springs. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was later bought by Mr. Liebling and all these lovely trees were taken out and we got a bunch of one-story small cheap mm -hmm. stores in the area. But it's just a, such a shock that we what we could have had. Uh, I think that's a indicative of, of what the early center of Palm Springs was like. Uh, there was, of course, the Oasis Hotel, uh, which was to the south. I'm not sure one of these... Um, no, that's some of the... the um, also, just south of the Desert Inn, of course, was the Oasis Hotel, which was the other uh, major, major hotel. Uh, the Desert Inn being over on this corner. This is Tacos McCallum. And this was the uh, early part of the dining room right at this point um, in the office of the Oasis Hotel. And part of this building is still preserved down on South Palm Canyon. And what is it? The, vill the Village got, Green? Yeah, it's the Village Green. Like it's that. like a little art gallery. Well, anyway, that is the mm -hmm. corner. And then as you proceeded south, you saw the main part mm -hmm. of the hotel. And then there was a, I think one more on Beautiful that. Beautiful car. Well, that's a lovely car. Yeah. Yeah. This was the old oh, tower that tower Lloyd Wright yes. did. 
uh, in the background there. That was a, a sort of a central feature. And then there were some um, hotel wings behind. It was a small hotel, only mm -hmm. had perhaps only 40, 50 rooms at the most. Uh, but it was a one-story frame building and uh, very nicely detailed architecturally. They saved that dining room, the cross section of the mm -hmm. dining room, and put it down there at the Village Green. Well, that was the other major hotel in Palm Springs. Uh, they, um, some of the other major buildings that we uh, found when we came, uh, this was the famous Bank of America. Oh yes, on the uh, east side of Palm Canyon. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, one of the um, uh, largest buildings in the town. Um, uh, it was, uh, I think, two stories, think of it. They, they, don't, they finally didn't allow two stories <laughs> in the town, but at that time we had this building. Here was the uh, telephone building. Oh, yes. And um, I proposed to my wife over yeah, the Yeah, corporate headquarters of the Desert Sun. Right here. <laughs> this was the major house of the Desert Sun. And there was another little building uh, somewhere, I don't think I brought it, but anyway, there was another paper called the Limelight it's News. It's in there, I saw it. It's there. somewhere in here, it's I'm a, not sure, but oh, here it is. There it is. Uh, this was the competing newspaper. Uh, this is the Limelight News here, one of the major uh, affairs. And uh, then beside the, uh, the hotel, no, beside the telephone building, which was here on North Palm Canyon, uh, this was City Hall. This is the Palm Springs City Hall. It says you can see Palm Springs in here, and, uh, but you can't see it behind the... Uh, but uh, that and was there the... There were uh, how many employees? There were three. Time? There was um, uh, City Manager Fred Allworth and Pete Peterson, who was the clerk, and one secretary. And that was... A, and our taxes were considerably lower than the other <laughs> day. <laughs> anyway, that was the size of the city, and that was all it took to govern it, because... Uh, we didn't have any building inspectors as yet, or any building department, or any codes. It was just uh, it was much easier to build then. Uh, yes, and it now. Really was. There were also some other famous hotels here. This was called the El Rey Hotel, and I think somewhere down here. Oh yes, this was elegant. Here was the Royal Palms, mm. and uh, uh, somebody really went all. And you see, this is our. This is early Spanish influenced by the Greek Empire. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then right across the street from this was the Indianoia. That oh, yeah. was uh, influenced in by the native Indians. Right and you could go in there. That was Freddie Watson's little mm -hmm. shop. And you could go in there and buy artifacts and, uh, and uh, desert uh, rocks and things of this sort. And right next to it was one of the better places one could get a cool drink called the milk uh, malt shop, I believe. And then, of course, there were the major stores like Carl Lickens. That was the hardware dry goods store. Here was the only grocery store. You know, all on Palm Canyon, of course. Well, everything was. And here was the Ren Redland Sanitary Laundry Company. And another major building called the Grove Building. That's where it came from. And this little gem, I don't know what the name of it was, but that was indicative of the architecture in Palm Springs. That's Spring. the five and ten, yes. Yeah, sure. And to tell you the truth, when, when I first heard the, the um, uh, somebody coined the phrase about the world's foremost desert resort, I couldn't help but really smile. Really, when you go back and think of it, this is what we had to offer the public. As the world's foremost as a result. And it was just utterly ridiculous. I thought it, it, this was somebody's real estate office. <laughs> and the rest of Palm Canyon, mm -hmm. now going to the south, uh, here, was the, here was Desmond's. And as we proceed to the south, mm -hmm. now you can just all pull right, that over right. towards you a little bit that I'm way. Put these fine. down here just a moment. And then uh, next to the, that was Maloose small oh, yeah. store and it's still there highly remodeled and then in the corner was the Tocquets pharmacy that a fellow by the name of Gibby yeah. ran that and we'd go down there and have lunch once in a while now that's the end of town on South Palm Canyon that was about in Vallejo, right? this, this is an, 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 Arenas this Arenas? is Arenas yeah. this is Arenas here and the plaza was up here and then Maloose and this is Tocquets pharmacy and that's the end of town. Mm -hmm. This starts the south corner mm -hmm. of Arenas, like this, and on south in Palm Canyon was this, 
just contiguous and this <laughs> and this <laughs> there was nothing on the east side of Palm Canyon all the way to Ramon Road mm. nothing at all in fact when I came Ramon Road was there there was some old house in there somewhere it belonged to somebody named mm. Kellogg but uh, uh, and uh, I think that uh, Erwin Chewin bought some of this property and put up the old, uh, um, what was it, uh, Safeway store. Mm -hmm. But anyway, now you get some idea of the <coughs> state of the art as it was practiced in Palm Springs. And um, I might say that there was absolutely, um, you know, some people talk about the Spanish influence in California. Well, the Spaniards somehow overlooked Palm Springs. There never was a Spaniard here, and there was never a mission, and the, the Indian tribes certainly had no love for the Spaniards. So there was no Spanish tradition whatsoever in Palm Springs. Oh, the Desert Inn was and, the And the Desert Inn was just example. a big, beautiful, uh, big, uh, huge room with the uh, big... Uh, hand-hewn beams and a tile roof, which was a very, mm, tile tiles are very uh, excellent material used in the, in the desert. It's a last forever. But there was certainly no Spanish tradition, and the fact that my father went to Santa Barbara and <laughs> brought some of the early Spanish down here, I think that's about the, the beginning and the end of the Spanish tradition as far as Palm Springs is concerned. Mm -hmm. Now, for someone like yourself, who was heavily influenced by the Bauhaus and the International School of Architecture. Uh, this must have been quite a challenge to uh, come to the desert in 46 and see all these dwellings and uh, <laughs> to at least dream of what you might have been able to do. Uh, let's regress for a moment yeah. and just talk about uh, the time and when you, you came, which I think was 1946, just after the war, and, and the circumstances surrounding that, and then some of the early jobs that uh, came your way led to your staying here? Well, when, when we first came down, there was a bit of a boom on right after the war, and people were beginning to build the motels and even a hotel. And I think uh, one of our earliest jobs was uh, a building that... Pepper tree was? No, it was the, the, a hotel up on the corner of a... Of, um, uh, I was going to say uh, Howard Manor. No, it, it was it was the B Bisno Brothers that built oh, that Bil hotel. Oh, Bisno you know? Hotel. And I don't know what the name of it was going to be called, but it, it never got finished. They ran out of money, which they was a typical Chicago. situation. Um, the the early jobs in Palm Springs were primarily you know, residences so that you could uh, uh, you'd get them one at a time. They usually started out remodeling garages into a guest room and then a new house occasionally. Um, the international style was, um, as far as Palm Springs is concerned, uh, was totally unheard of. Albert Frey had come here with training uh, totally in the international style of architecture in France and Switzerland. He worked for Corbusier and he had come here and had done two or three uh, individual buildings including his own house and one for Dr. Coker and those were the only buildings in Palm Springs that were done in the in so-called international mm -hmm. style. Um, actually I was never a devotee of the international style per se I knew about it and it was a great influence on uh, contemporary architecture in the sense that it broke loose from traditional forms and taught everybody to think from the ground up and to invent your own forms and so forth. But the international style was a, um, a had a series of rather rigid uh, tenets and rules and regulations by which everybody went. There was a, a first absolute geometric forms, uh, cubes and and cylinders and um, the uh, Corbusier, um, what you might call an idiom saying that the house was a machine for living. Uh, it was all related to the industrial revolution mm -hmm. and the production of, of materials through a machine instead of going out in the forest or the quarry and picking up materials. 
So it was a, uh, a very important phase of early architect contemporary architecture, but I have always felt that um, architecture should be approached uh, uh, with an open mind and uh, you have a program, whatever the client wants, whatever the site dictates, and uh, then you are faced with a different climate here than you have in Seattle, and uh, you have a different climate here than you have in Florida, and, and um, uh, you don't have a set of rules that covers everything. You have to sit down and see what you can afford to use in the way of materials, and after you get your program worked out, you, you uh, select materials that suit the program, suit the client, and I have always said if you just use natural materials, materials that are uh, things like uh, uh, concrete and uh, stone and uh, brick and, and metal and glass, uh, wood. I don't like stucco, I don't like paint because they don't hold up. Um, every time we have used stucco, I look back at it now and it's all cracked and crazed. And um, I always have, have tried to use, in every building I've done, as many natural materials and natural finishes and just let the beauty of the material uh, be the, uh, the thing that you see on the finish, not cover it with stucco and cover it with paint. And I think that uh, more or less rule is has uh, guided me all through the years that we've done work here. Of course, I think also you have to, an architect often has to gradually get the client to change their preconceived ideas of what they want. I'm thinking back to Frank Sinatra. There was little Frank, when he first came out here and he made his first million, and his idea, you know, he was a grocery clerk and a grocery, son of a grocery store owner. And his idea was if he ever had money, he was going to build a big, beautiful Georgian uh, mansion with columns and stone balustrades and all. Now, he came in the office, and that's what he wanted. He wanted to build this Georgian thing with all the red brick and all, and well, Stu nearly dropped his teeth. So <laughs> Stu says, well, Frank, what we'll do, I I'm going to have Rods design this thing you're talking about, because uh, I know that's what you've been thinking. But he said, I'm going to... Uh, lay out what I think fits the desert a little better, and then we'll let you decide. Well, Stu did the first Sinatra house with its low stone and wood, and fortunately, Frankie looked at him and he said, yeah, that does look better out of there, rather than a steep roof with brick and stone. We were so glad because we'd been ruined right there and there if we'd been forced to build that on the desert. So, But this often happens in architecture. And that was built in the early 50s. That was right no, after the war. It was built in 46. 46. 40, early. In fact, he started off with four bathrooms, and the government only allowed to put in one bathroom. Building was scarce. So we had a planet for the future, and he started with one bathroom, because that was when he was still married to Nancy. And then as he it came... It was built over on Alejo. Alejo. Yes, I have a picture of it here that I'll get out if you want. <laughs> Yes, while we were talking about the, uh, the Sinatra house, uh, actually it was built you know, right after the war in 46, early 47, in fact it was in 46. It was the first, uh, first thing really that we did. Um, I think he came in in the summertime, uh, possibly in June, July, along in there, and uh, uh, I don't know where Frank was staying down here, but <clears throat> his main criteria was that he'd be in the house by Christmas. <laughs> now, we hadn't started the drawings, and he wanted to be in the house by Christmas. So we allocated three months to the design and the building, and we got a, a good contractor up in, in Redlands, the name of Lou Scher, uh, who uh, put his men on three shifts a day. We worked continually right through from the start of September, and uh, Frank moved in at Christmas. I'd and this was, his, uh, this was his uh, house. Uh, it was the first, uh, one of the first shed roof houses, I guess, in the desert. It was pitched. Pool was the shape the of pool, a grand piano. I remember the pool, he wanted a grand piano shaped like this. This was the living room, and this was the master bedroom over here. 
and a living dining area and through here and looked out on this. It was a pool house back here with dressing rooms for guests and so forth. But uh, it was essentially a redwood. Uh, the wood was all redwood and there was some masonry in mm -hmm. the chimney and some of the well, this was rock a, work. Um, flagstone pavements and so forth. But it was uh, the first house we did in the desert here. And um, after a couple of years of uh, doing other small uh, uh, jobs, we, we also uh, were contacted by uh, some people from Seattle. Actually, I had, I had had an apartment up on Palm Canyon, and these people had uh, an adjacent apartment, and we got to know them. And uh, when they decided to come down to the desert, uh, we met these people, and uh, this was a chap by the name of William Idris from uh, from Seattle, and uh, he had a very young, uh, very beautiful wife with him, and uh, they were interested in building a house. So uh, they had rented a house, and the first year we just did a pool for them in the old house that was up in Tuscany, and the next year they bought a lot, and uh, so then we. Uh, uh, did another house uh, somewhat m more sophisticated mm -hmm. than Mr. Sinatra's house. This is the Idris house up on the hill. And uh, we, uh, we tried to, to not move a boulder, just tried to put the house in the environment in which it was intended. And there was a little arroyo here which we dug out and put the pool down below it. I have other pictures. This is the only one that I brought. Overdue, uh, but it uh, still stands today um, in just as perfect condition as it was then. It was built in 1953. You might add, you left every rock because if you moved it, there was always another one right there. Yes. <laughs> in fact, I can remember you yeah. laying out the swing pool. We measured every rock to see how to build a pool around the rock. Around the rock. Because yeah, you couldn't dig out a big 20 foot area. boulder out of a pool bottom. Uh, this is an interesting house. And it's uh, always uh, one of the uh, uh, points uh, of contention between Albert Frey and myself. Albert has always said, well, you can't use wood in the desert. This house is built of wood. It's steel frame, but the finish is all wood except for the chimney and one or two little side uh, frame, uh, walls, thin walls. Um, Albert says you can't use wood in the desert. It goes to pot just breaks down. Uh, that's not true. You have to use dry wood to start with. And you've got a nice dry desert and nothing ever happens to dry wood. The only thing that breaks down wood is alternately wetting and drying and wetting and drying. And so, you know, we had uh, excavations in Egypt out of the tombs of Egypt in which wood objects after three or four thousand years were in perfect condition because they stayed dry all the time. And this house, you go up there today, that's a, almost 40 years ago, um, it is in just perfect condition today. And of course, Mrs. Idris keeps it in immaculate anyway. But it was an interesting, uh, uh, I think, example of what one can uh, there's do. There's a house in which you have um, very carefully integrated the design right into the existing mm -hmm. The site, the site, of course. And, uh, I think that theme, uh, that kind of integration, has continued in your architecture right through to the present day. Uh, and another thing too, I think uh, this is an example of good design and good structure. Um, we did this. Uh, you framed it in steel. Do you remember? It's all major mm -hmm. horizontal steel beams and pipe columns inside, and then we had shear walls and. Uh, Mrs. Idris called me up last week. She was here and she had dinner with some people across the across this uh, little uh, swale here. And uh, they said uh, they were complaining about the problems you had with that le recent earthquake last summer. Mrs. Idris said she didn't have a single crack or a single chip in the whole house. Mm -hmm. People across the way had $97,000 worth mm -hmm. of damage. And that's indicative of what happens when you have good construction and good engineering to start with. The, the thing shows up 50 years later. Of course, so we got accused of building Fort Knox as always. Yes, it cost too much money. 
they were expensive architects, but I still like my building to be there after the earthquake and not like the other guy. You know, the use of materials is very, very important. And, and you know, uh, when we were east, lived in the east, the concrete block came into, into uh, use. And it was generally used for, the, uh, for basements. Uh, and it was uh, generally used for uh, garages and that sort of thing. Well, in 40, uh, 47, we, um, yeah. we got a, a uh, commission to do the first uh, Jewish community center here in Palm Springs. And uh, there was to be a social center and also the synagogue. And uh, we just did one room, which was the synagogue. And this is the, uh, this is the picture of it. And it's in concrete block. And it won a first honor award uh, for the, in the American Institute of Architects because it was just as simple and beautiful as a finished church or anything else in its lines. It was uh, no, no pretense or anything, exposed concrete block, but every detail, just the lectern and the, the seven candles here and the ark and the, the uh, various uh, simple uh, uh, lines of this. Uh, shows that you can take a very common material and if you spend enough uh, nights working on the drawings you probably can come up with something that will win a, an honor award. Uh, but those were some of the early buildings that, that we did along with a few hotels like Pepper Tree Inn and the Colony and so forth. Uh, that uh, filled most of the first decade while we were here. And then we built a new office in the Oasis building. You know where the Oasis Hotel was? And uh, at that time, uh, Western Hotel purchased the Oasis and they wanted to build something new in the back. And so they um, tore down the old hotel, salvaged some of the beauty of its... They left the tower, incidentally. It's still there. But um, the corner uh, was uh, to be a new office building and at that time we made a, a deal with uh, Eddie Carlson who was a then vice president he later became president uh, to to have a new office over there I think I um, I brought this um, picture over this was the building that we uh, built on the corner of the Oasis Hotel and we had our um, had our new offices there uh, we were on the north side of the big window, and we had our our offices there. With Harry was still alive, and this was our reception room and uh, our uh, reception here and conference room, and uh, our drafting room down through here and the files and everything. Everything was very well organized, at least in the office. I that was before we got it all mixed up and working. <laughs> <Yeah. there. coughs> Yes, well, sometimes I, it didn't look good. Interesting <laughs> thing, Stu, I don't know if you remember, but I did go to the engineering, but it was right after the war because you couldn't get such a thing as a simple steel beam or steel comms, only leftover things they'd done for the war, like junior beams that had holes in them and all. And we had a, anything we could find that would hold up a floor. It's a darnest combination of structure. If you ever took it off, they'd say, who in the heck was your engineer? Say, <laughs> but it was a necessity because you couldn't get regular steel. It was, a, a, it was this structure. kind of a special system with punched beams. Yeah, punched beams, what junior, them. they call them junior. But it was well designed. It, yeah, was a it stayed there. To yeah. stand up and it stayed there earthquakes. through all uh, the problems. There was another building at that time in the early days, uh, which I think still stands in Palm Springs. And lots and lots of people have gotten enjoyment out of it. And that's the auditorium at the high school. Seats oh, yeah. 1100 and is still one of the best acoustical buildings in uh, Southern California. Yes, it was designed acoustically by Dr. Uh, Vern Knudsen, uh, who, you know, Knudsen Hall at UCLA is, is uh, named after him. But it's a place that most people in Palm Springs have been to many concerts and the community concerts still hold their uh, events here. And uh, it's a kind of an interesting shell. They, uh, Everything in this room is specifically designed to do uh, something. Um, the, uh, the ceiling up here is a plane that's a part of a, almost a straight plane. This is kind of a part of a cone that reflects uh, sound downwards. 
the side walls here uh, carry air throughout and then this reflects sound out to the audience this absorbs sound this back uh, side is designed to absorb sound from the and not reflect it back into the microphones and of course the audience is the intent and purpose uh, of all these surfaces are designed to focus the sound on each seat but it uh, was one of these early uh, jobs in which um, natural materials were used throughout and the form of every single thing in it is a functional form now that is what contemporary architecture is all about use good materials design forms that function to make the job mm -hmm. work because if a job doesn't work well it um, uh, it, you'll soon find it out. Well, the uh, school board also had the backing of the people because uh, up to this time there was no place for, I remember the L.A. Symphony would come down to play and they played out in the high school, that courtyard behind and we get one of our lovely little winds blowing and all the music go flying. They'd have to stop and collect the music and then try it over again. So that was really the first mm -hmm. auditorium where they could perform inside. So. Now from as I recall, from around the mid-50s on, uh, you began to do larger commercial type projects, oh, more than residences and small homes. And that's right. I think there are some very significant buildings uh, in downtown Palm Springs, such as the Coachella Valley Bank, uh, the Santa Fe Federal Bank building, and others that uh, really became the major portion of your work. And, uh, perhaps we could talk a little bit about those jobs and how they came about? Well, our, uh, when we got into this new office that we were speaking of, um, we became uh, a little more organized and uh, in our uh, duties, um, my job was to more or less uh, take care of client contact and, and early design preliminary design, conce uh, the concept, conceptual design. Um, Roger was involved by that time mostly in the structure uh, of the work and did a lot of the structural design. And um, it was a combination of working together on these things, uh, early individual uh, marketing you might call it and uh, then production and we worked together very well on this in this combination that um, building that you spoke of uh, the Coachella Valley building uh, was a pre uh, well it wasn't it was really precast and partially poured in place um, all of the beams were free span concrete for a hundred feet and supported in both east and uh, west sides with concrete poured in place columns and um, these columns come down like this and uh, anchored in the footings and at this level the main floor slab acts as a, a sort of a brace and then this this uh, tapered uh, column going up like this in both sides um, in takes care of the this is rather open and takes care of the earthquake uh, requirements no, in the north south horizontal diaphragms in the technical yeah layer. this is a horizontal diaphragm and so is the, so is the, the roof, roof slab and these were actually inverted rigid bents instead of a rigid bent that's above ground they were at the bottom with the points up and it was made a nice scheme with the water below so anyway that, that was a very beautiful building today yes one of your most impressive designs. Well, it was, uh, you know, when you stop and think about what we found when we came to Palm Springs, those little, those little buildings up and down the street, we think that uh, these things are a credit to the town, and I'm sure they'll be there for a long time after we're gone. But it was uh, this end, the, uh, as you sp I don't have any pictures of the, uh, of the little Santa Fe building, which is now I think American Savings, is across from across from Robinson's. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that building is a very charming little jewel box. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of interesting. Doctor uh, Mr. Patterson, who was president of Santa Fe, uh, used those words. He says, "Williams, that's the reason I ask you to come up here." He said, uh, "Their office was in San Bernardino." He said, 
I, I want to build a little jewel box in Palm Springs. And he, I think he really did. We built a little glass, mm -hmm. four walls of glass, and there's a screens on the west and the east that slide back and forth to shield it from the sun. And the north wall is still open. As you drive down uh, Bristow over there, you can see. And it's uh, on little uh, pipe columns with fins on to give the up. column a little heavier ratio, of slenderness ratio. And uh, it's uh, uh, one of the better little buildings and I think it'll, it's steel frame and so almost by that time we were doing things in steel and concrete uh, more permanent materials and, and uh, uh, more rigid frames and so forth. Uh, then we got uh, together with Albert and John uh, in doing the tramway. So now that's an interesting story in yeah. itself. I think. Maybe you could What's tell us something? about how you interacted with Francis Crocker. And I can recall some early models in your office of how this uh, tram would go up the hillside and take us up there in 10 or 15 minutes to this cool. Well, I think also I, it, this may have already been recorded from Francis Crocker and so on, but I always explained the tramway was that the state created the authority but no money. And Francis and Crocker and Earl Coffin, they said, well, to get, it should be done with private funds, but to get private funds or sell bonds, you have to have firm bids, and to get firm bids, you must have drawings, still no money. So they had to find somebody, architects and engineers, that were willing to do a lot of work for nothing for a period of nearly 12 years, exploring the possibilities and climbing the mountain and horseback and sleeping up there in sleeping bags to come up with final designs so they could then bid, and our agreement was if they ever did build it, then we would get 2% more on our fee instead of 8, we would get 10. Of course, we didn't make any money on it, but it was a really uh, interesting project. And I remember my first trip up the tram when it was done, I went up, tie, coat, went up 12 minutes, had a scotch and water and a steak dinner. Before, it used to take me a whole day riding a darn horse up those <laughs> dirty trails, and I thought, man, this is really something. And I got very disturbed when years following I'd ride up there and some of our visitors evidently do not appreciate nature but they on the way up they were reasonably happy. They weren't looking out at the wonderful scenes but they with the idea they're going to get somewhere. When they get there they say well, what's to do up there? Let's get the heck down. See so I just thought gee now here I thought this was wonderful going from a desert valley up to all these transition to the climates, these beautiful trees, and I appreciate that so greatly, knew the hardships we went through to get it there, and then to have a bunch of people say, ah, nothing doing up here, let's get back down, have a drink <laughs> well, or something. Well, the action is. Well, you know, so this <laughs> upsets you as an architect, but there are other people that raved over the gorgeous scenery, so I, 50 so. <laughs> Did you ever envision building that project by helicopter? No. Um, Actually, by the we were we were asked to do the surveys to start with um, for the st for the stations. Um, a different group, uh, Tudor Engineering, was hired to survey the canyons for the towers, and a third group, uh, the Von Roll people, um, were eventually hired to do the tramway uh, machinery and uh, cables and so forth. Uh, actually the tramway was was uh, originally to be built by Morrison, Knudsen and um, American Steel and Wire. And uh, because they couldn't weave a cable long enough to go from the bottom to the top, the first plan we had 12, uh, had a dog leg in it. And there was two, there were two stations one at the bottom, one at the top, and an intermediate transfer station. And um, that plan cost, according to their estimates, about twelve, thirteen million dollars and was not feasible. That was uh, something that was done back in the 49 and 50. And we had a design at the top for a particular uh, con angle of, of uh, travel had to come from to the north side 
And um, that was dropped, and for 10 years it just was in limbo. As Roger said, we gambled well, but uh, it was a long time. And then in the early 60s, 59, seemed to me right after the Korean War was when things broke loose again. By that time, American Steel and Wire had found out a way to weave a cable that would go in one full length. Um, Mr. Kaufman had gone to Switzerland and talked to the people who were involved in the trams over there and had gotten them interested. And Francis Crocker had gotten some people uh, by the name of uh, L.E. Dixon and another man that I, who was a sort of silent partner with Dixon, uh, to uh, interested in building the building. So when it all sort of came together after the Korean War and we did a new set of drawings, just abandoned the old drawing, did a new set of drawings which envisioned one station at the bottom and one at the top just connected by cables and I have a picture of it here that oh. um, what was finally the the station at the bottom we this joined was, uh, Albert Frey, yeah. Yeah. That's right. and John, yeah, they, this yeah. is right we had um, a, a joint venture with uh, uh, Clark and Frey, and at that time Bob Chambers had joined their firm. And um, so we divided the work up between us. Uh, Albert Frey and Bob Chambers uh, took the lower station, and uh, Roger and I did the uh, station at the mountain. And uh, John Clark was the coordinating architect mm -hmm. for both firms and the, and the uh, authority and also did all the parking and all the uh, mechanical uh, power and things like that that had to be gotten and take, took care of all the water and sewage and everything else, the utilities, and in general coordinated the two firms. This was the lower station. Uh, it was built from one pier over here across the canyon uh, to the main uh, concrete tower over here which held the uh, motivating machinery that hauls the cars up and down and uh, this uh, building is a truss two walls of it are big truss you can see the form of it right here a spanned across this uh, this canyon and uh, two summers ago we had a tremendous rainstorm to the right not up this canyon not up the Chino Canyon but to the right, over in a box canyon over here that dumped a cloudburst into this area, it came down, all the water came down through. We had a, a lovely group of trees over in here and on the right side, and they had little animal gardens up through there. And this cloudburst just cut a 35-foot canyon right through those trees, and the, the water was right up to the bottom of this with boulders coming down through here. And it's almost, it almost mm. took this bridge out right here. It bent the big girders under the bridge, but it didn't touch the building because they're on these two big concrete piers. But that's uh, kind of an interesting, you can see how rugged this tremendous, uh, people don't realize down on the canyon, down on the highway, what a rugged place this is up here, but you can see the cables going on up. Now when we got up to the top, we were dealing with a little different, this is in the city of Palm Springs, uh, at the top is a um, state, a state uh, park, and the state wouldn't let us touch anything. They wouldn't let us cut a tree down unless it was just under the building. They wouldn't let us take any gravel or sand. We had to take all the gravel and sand up in the helicopters for the foundation. Even water. Well, they had to bring it, and they established a camp up there. They had to bring their own water up. All of this, we got to take everything up by helicopter, some 23,000 trips. 